But what are these old books that I'm talking about? La Varenne's The French Cook, ou uh, in French Le Cuisinier Français, came out in 1651, and it was immediately hailed as a revolution in French cookbooks. This wasn't too hard, since there weren't any real French cookbooks to speak of before this. Um, there had been a couple discovered in the 14th century, but these were largely copies of other manuscripts coming from Italy. So Vachen was onto something truly new and special, distinctively French. 1651 is also a telling moment from what we've learned so far in this course. This is the height of the French culture of politesse, Civilité, and bienséance. Indeed, the editor of La Varenne's first edition said it was only natural that such a book be published in France at that time, since, quote, our France is superior over all other nations in the world in civility, courtesy, and bienseance, in all kinds of conversation, and France is not less esteemed for the way of life that is maintained here, which is honest and delicate. As Madame de Rambouillet was writing the rule book on polite conversation, Varenne was coming up with a culinary Bible that would change French cooking forever. So who was La Varenne, and why was his blandly titled bestseller, The French Cook, such a hit with the French people? Unfortunately, we have very little information regarding the father of French cuisine other than the very basics. Uh, his full name was François-Pierre de la Varenne. He was born 1615, died in 1678. He was Burgundian by birth, of course. And he worked as chef to the Duc d'Uxelle, the Duke of Uxelles. Um, little more is known of his personal life other than he may have studied under some of the Italian chefs that were traveling through France at this time on their way to, the, on their way to Paris uh, with the Medicis. Yet, he is considered the founder of classical French cooking because in addition to his clear explanation of techniques, ingredients, and preparations, he set down a code of basic rules that had to be obeyed and mastered if one wanted to make good French cuisine. His code was exhausted and admitted no exceptions. The recipes were ordered according to what could be served according to the religious calendar, uh, for example, young hares, partridges, or linfinches, goslings, grain-fed chickens, lambs, pheasant, pigeons, and young turkeys were permissible meats from the period between Easter and the Feast of St. John, which is end of June, at which point you would switch over to fattened chickens, young quail, turtle doves, young capons, peacocks, and young goats until the feast day of saint Remy, October 1st, and so on. The meals themselves were also ordered in a manner best suited to aid in digestion. This meant doing away with the buffet style popular during the Renaissance. Um, the sweet and salty parts of the meal were forever separated. Um, and prior to this innovation, vinegar and honey were often used in combination to produce the sweet and salty taste that I think uh, in the United States we still tend to appreciate. Um, very much unlike our French counterparts who hate, who tend to hate the, the blending of sweet and salty. But what kind of meals was La Varenne preparing? In fact, many of the wonderful innovations in his recipe book created the culinary foundations that we still refer to today, such as the prevalence of sauces. Although the Middle Ages had sauces as well, these were usually vinegar-based. Varenne's sauces instead were fat-based. 
and usually derived from the meats to be featured in the meal itself. Sauces for la varenne were not meant to mask the flavor of the food, but actually enhance it. Thus began the French love affair with butter. It was, and remains today, a very special relationship, even slightly forbidden at times. In fact, in earlier days, butter was banned during Lent and the Jour Maigre, which were the fast days, which were every Wednesday and Friday. Um, however, butter was considered so necessary to so many people that they were willing to pay the church officials six pounds for a butter indulgence. Hence, the name of Rouen's cathedrals, Tour de Beurre, or Butter Tower, the magnificently flamboyant Gothic tower built during the early 16th century with the money collected from the butter lovers. But if butter caused a bit of a dilemma for the stricter Catholics, broth posed no such problem. It was present at table throughout the liturgical calendar. Therefore, broth was the first meal item treated by La Varenne. He started into the matter straight away in the style of a very busy chef. You will take some beef shank, a little sheep, and some poultry, and you will cook it with an herb bouquet. Varenne is also credited with inventing the use of the culinary herb bouquet, composed here uh, of parsley, scallion, thyme, and a bit of cloves wrapped together. And fill the pot, he continued, with hot water, and once it is quite done, put it in a plate for serving. It's not too different from today's broths, minus the absence of vegetables, which during the medieval period uh, were generally considered indigestible and left to the peasants to eat. Whether born high or low, soup was a staple in France. A traveler in southwest France in 1789 raved over the newly invented instant soup in a letter to his family. The bread is all ready in a big wooden dish with a little knob of butter, and then the boiling water is poured over it. Voila, that's the soup. A clove of garlic and a raw onion grated by the cook and sprinkled over the soup that's the seasoning, the last word in culinary fashion. The soup is served, it's excellent. One eats it with a wooden spoon. I hope that was a huge piece of bread. Many of the recipes in the early French cookbooks are not too different from what we have today. Varenne invented the bisque soup, for example, and many of his recipes focus on reduction sauces. There are certain elements, however, that come off a bit foreign to us, the queen soup, for example, starts off quite well. It calls for a delicious sounding almond broth with capons and mushrooms, a bit of pulled partridge, all garnished with pistachios, pomegranate seeds, and crest. But what is crest or crête in the modern spelling? This is what we in English would call a comb, which is the fleshy red area on top of a rooster's head. During the classical age, this bit of the animal was used as a very high class garnish. And for those of you who have seen Babette's Feast, the wonderful 1987 Danish film by Gabriel Axel that features the artistry of French cuisine, you might be interested in Varenne's recommendation for a good tortoise soup or potage de tortue. First, cut off the legs and heads and saute them in water. Before they are quite cooked, Add a bit of white wine, some fine herbs, and lard. When the tortoises are cooked through, and how you can tell, I have no idea, take them out of their shells, remove the bile, cut them into pieces, and throw them in a pan with good butter. Let them simmer with your bread and broth. Finally, garnish it with well-seasoned asparagus, gravy, lemon, and serve. And for the truly adventurous palates, I would refer you to page 302, where you will find a recipe for frog beignet. I would like to note also that Varenne was a typical early modern chef, meaning he worked for wealthy patrons such as the Duke of Uxelles, yet his cookbook did not confine itself solely to the kitchens of the rich and famous. Sections of his book even discuss the meals to be prepared for mobilized armies. One word, ragu. Moreover, despite the fact that Varenne was chef to the greatest French men and women of his day, 
there seemed to be very little tolerance for waste. Every part of the animal had a role to play in French cuisine, from the tails to the tongues. If it could be covered in lard, it could be eaten. Even later at Versailles, when the food for the king was being prepared in the kitchens, it was reported that a full third of the township fed themselves off the court's kitchen scraps, which often were very fine indeed, and that there was so much abundance that another round of scrap purchasing usually occurred after this initial round. So with Varenne's cookbook and subsequently published Book of Pastries, we get a wonderful glimpse back into the food and politics around food of this early modern period. But based on the introductory remarks by the editor, we can also understand that gastronomy was developing as an expression of the distinctively French way of life and their savoir vivre. Although food, of course, was necessary to life and good health, the French cuisine at this time was being developed as an accessory item, regulated and embellished in order to exude national pride in life à la française. French gastronomy was on the highway to haute cuisine. <laughs>